Okay, so it's been a long time since I've done a um, YouTube live, like about a year, so I kind of forgot a few things. Um, <clears throat> now, if you haven't already, put in where you're from so you can connect with everyone. Oh, we've got people from Canada. I see Janelle is on here. Hi, Janelle. Uh, let's see, Sylvia, hello, Sylvia. South Carolina, Wisconsin, Ohio, Florida. Green Acres, Washington. We've got Washington State, Texas, New York. More Texas, oh, UK, Western PA, Maryland, Ohio. Okay, great. So if you haven't, um, if you're sitting here knitting, I'm gonna be, I probably won't have time to knit, but I want you to think of this as knitting time with lots of friends. So pick up your knitting. Um, I'm working on a, um, hopefully a knitted bucket hat. I've had a lot of requests for those. So this one is in the works. And I'm also working on a slow diagonal shawl and it will have some color changes to it. So if you, once you've put in where you're from, I want you to go ahead and tell me what you're knitting. Even if you're not knitting this second, tell me what's on your needles. And then you can just settle in. I've gotten about 60 questions here, so I'm gonna answer them as quickly as I can. I've organized them so that I can um, group them together. And you've asked a lot of really great questions. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun today. <clears throat> Okay, I'm still getting people telling me I'm sideways. Hmm. So I'm looking at this. I know that my last one, I did I did my last one going widthwise because it was for YouTube, but if you're watching it on your phone, even if you're watching it on your phone, it should go the other way. Let me see if this helps. Nope. <clears throat> it does not want me to rotate. So I'm set like this for now, it looks like. Yeah, it won't let me um it won't let me turn it. So this is the way I'm set. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> um so let's get into all these questions. I uh let's see. We've got somebody's knitting a swatch a cowl, some spinning, mittens, a sweater. Awesome. Awesome. I want you to knit and really enjoy. You, just li you can listen to me while I tell you what your friends or questions are or answer your questions. But like I said, we have a ton. So let's get into it right now. Um, the first questions are about notions. And I may have reorganized your questions based on the type of question it is, just to make it a little easier to find here. So <laughs> the first question is from Soapy. She actually asked a couple of questions on, um, on circular needles. She said, I would like to know about circular needles. What are good lengths and good, qual good qualities? I have read a number of articles about types of connections mostly not good. I have a horrible time with circular needles, but would really like to use them. Is one length better than another? I've heard that the 40 inch is good to do anything, but that the that crazy wire drives me nuts and always gets in the way. She also asked, I noticed from one of your videos that you like the Addy Click interlocking needles. I do too, however, one question. Does the yarn ever get caught at the joint location? From the look of the needles, it appears that the yarn could get caught, so I was wondering if you ever had that experience. Okay, so first of all, I've written an article on interchangeable knitting, and I have a video on interchangeable knitting needles, and I want you to check it out. 
So if you go into the description, you'll find tons of links in there that I've put in that will help answer your questions. But don't jump ahead. Let me let me talk to you about that. But um, Soapy, if you go check that out, you'll be able to see your um, the link to interchangeable needles. I love the Addy Clicks. They're smooth. They're really top of the line. They are some of the best needles you can buy. They're made in Germany, you know, with that German precision and they don't catch on anything. They are really great needles to work with. Um, and it sounds like you're ready to invest in an interchangeable needle set. What happens with an interchangeable set is that you get all of the sizes you get from like a size two to maybe a 10 or from a five to a 15, you get a wide range of needle tips and then they attach to the various cables. So you always have the right size needle. I don't very often use a 40 inch needle. I know a lot of people like to knit magic loop. That's just not something I enjoy, but I will whip out a, um, I like to use the size needle that is called for. Um, so for example, this hat that I'm working in the round is on a, I think this is a 24 inch needle, maybe a 20 inch because these are the Addy Clicks that I'm on right now. And um, and then I have exactly the right needle length so that I can knit around without any problem. And this project I know is going to be huge, so I'm on a circular needle. And one of the things you can do if these winding up um, is driving you crazy the way the needles sometimes twist up, you can put this in hot water for a few seconds, maybe a minute, and it will relax the um, cable. And then what you do is you run it under cold water right after and it'll set the plastic. Um, but make sure that you're not putting the needle tips themselves or the join in the hot water. So that's a little tip for you to loosen up those stitches. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that is your answer. The next one is Mary Pat. What are the benefits of square knitting needles? Are they really more comfortable? Well, there are some benefits and I've noticed in the industry, I've been in here in this industry for over 20 years, um, needles are kind of like a novelty in the knitting world. And every year somebody comes out with like some exciting new change and I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago, square needles came out and everyone was using them. I've tried them a few times. I, we sold them in the store. I do like them, but they take some getting used to. Um, you would think it was, it's uncomfortable, but it's not. Like your hand rests exactly on those square points. So I would say give them a try. Don't invest in all of them, but if you have a popular size that you like to use, use that, you know, buy a length, I don't know, maybe a 16 or 24 inch circular, or if you like to knit on a size eight straight needle, buy a pair and try them out because you may fall in love with them. They are supposed to be ergonomic, easier on your hands, um, and for some reason, less dropped stitches. So, uh, and they also are supposed to pro provide more even knitting. So I would recommend giving them a try. Um, if you're looking for an interchangeable set, I recommend Knitter's Pride Cubics. And I think I put a link in the description for you on that. <clears throat> oh, Cal uh, Kathy McLaughlin says, yes, square needles are wonderful, nice tension. So one of your knitting friends answered it for you. <laughs> oh, somebody else says I get pony knitting circular needles. Okay, so we are on to the next question, and this one is from Judy. How do you knit around stitch markers without leaving a gaping hole? I have tried several sizes and everything from simple circles to crochet markers I can remove, but when I slip the marker and then knit or purl the next stitch, there's always a big hole. Help me, Nancy. So I have, I have a dropped stitch here. Let me put this on, okay. So 
One of the things you have to remember is that when the knitting is on the needle, it looks much different than when it's off the needle. So I have actually a pretty big stitch marker on here for the size of the needle that it is. Um, and if I looked at it individually, you'll see, oh boy, that's a hole there. Like, well, that's never gonna come out. But when you take it off the needles and that, the, you know, knitting is pliable. This is one strand of yarn, so it can stretch and give and, and there's some movability to it. So don't look at it as it's on the needle. Look at it after your knitting is finished and you will see, I bet, almost, I bet a lot of money that that's gonna go away. So one tip I do have is that if you're having trouble with circular needles getting caught, I mean with um, stitch markers getting caught on your knitting or that you're accidentally knitting them, try to stick as close to the right size as possible. So they do make stitch markers. Um, Clover actually makes really good sized stitch markers that, you know, it'll say this fits size zero to eight needle or this fits um, size six to 11 needle. Get one that fits close to size so that you're not ending up with this big stitch marker that is, you know, pushing the yarn down. So keep trying it. And like I said, don't worry about it so much when it's on the needle, it's when you take it off the needles and you look at your knitting. And also, if you do have holes, which I've never had like that um, from a stitch marker, blocking does wonders, so. Okay, and the next question I have is from Dorothy. She says, when knitting a top-down jumper or sweater, uh, what needle length, what circular needle length is best to knit the sleeves? Well, it depends on the construction. Sometimes they will have you, if you're knitting top down, they'll have you knit in the round. So you wanna get it as close to the size as possible. So most likely you're gonna need like a 16 inch or 12 inch when you get down to the cuffs. They do make, um, they do make 12 inch that will, and even nine inch that will fit around those tight spots. Um, so I recommend those. You could also do double points. Some people find them a little fiddly for sweaters, but they do work really well. So those are your options are double pointed needles, a nine inch, 12 inch, and 16 inch. My next question is from Victoria. My index finger is sore from knitting. I use stainless steel needles. What else could I use that won't hurt my finger? So yes, yeah, stainless steel, which is what I'm working with right now, if you tend to be one of those people that pushes your stitch off with your finger to like get it from one needle to the other, you're going to have some pain. And what I do is make a conscious effort to not push it. I try to slide it instead, instead of pushing it. So... Now this is gonna be backwards because I am a lefty. But, so when I'm knitting the stitch, what I wanna do is I wanna put my finger up here and push it off, but I'm not going to, I'm gonna take my finger away and I'm going to use, oh, I hope that helps. Um, also, you could use other materials. Bamboo and wood is much softer on the hands than, um, than stainless and also, you could look for a more rounded point. Not all needle points are this sharp. You can find some that are really um, more blunt. Uh, so those are some options for you. Now, uh, now we're moving on to yarn questions and I see there's 121 people on here. So we've pretty much doubled the size of people from when we started. So if you haven't already, I welcome all of you. Please go ahead and put in the um, comments where you're from. We would love to greet you and you know say hi and know if there's other knitters near us or from afar. And also put in the chat what you're knitting right now, if you're knitting right here or just what's on your needles. I have a couple projects going, so put that in the comments. And now we'll continue with yarn questions. 
Caroline asks, have you ever gotten ice yarns and what is my favorite yarns? Now, my favorite, yeah, what are my favorite yarns? Um, I haven't knitted ice yarns. I know they've been around for a very long time. Um, I'm gonna say at least 15 years. I've seen their yarns. Um, most of them are acrylics and I'm sure if you've seen the prices on them are like ridiculous. Like some of them are 84 cents. So keep in mind with yarn, you're getting what you pay for. If you're just looking for something that's, you know, going to kids or you're not really going to do anything special with it, I would give ice yarns a try. And hey, at that price, why not give it a try? Maybe you really love it. They do have quite a few novelty yarns. Um, so I haven't tried them, but at that price, it might be worth giving it a try. However, I do have tons of favorite yarn brands. Now, I owned an online and brick and mortar store for a total of, um, of 20 years. So I know all of the yarns in the industry that are, you know, exhibiting, selling to yarn stores. And I have way more favorites than I could list here. And, and they're always coming out with new yarns and new yarn brands. There's lots of hand dyers out there. Um, but I did list my favorites. Um, some of my favorite companies are Knit Picks. Now I want to tell you, Knit Picks is like my go-to yarn company at the moment. And what I love about them is they are the manufacturer. And a lot of times with yarn companies is they're manufactured mostly in another country. And then they're imported by a distributor into this country. And then they're sold to a yarn store so the yarn store can sell them to you. Well, those layers add on lots of costs. Knit Picks, however, is their own, is the manufacturer as well as the retailer. So you are getting much better value for your, for your dollar um, because you're not paying all these additional prices. And they have a ton of different yarns at really great um they have all the weights you can think of, and you'll see a lot of Knit Picks yarns in my knitting projects because I really love them. Other companies that I absolutely love are, uh, they're also direct, Lion Brand, UU Yarns is direct, Universal Yarns, Premier Yarns. If you want to see any of these links, I've put them in the description below, so they'll be, this information will be there for you for eternity. So <clears throat> my next question is from Raina. Can you recommend a good source of finding yarn substitutes? I often find a pattern I like, but I can't find the exact yarn called for, or maybe it's not in my budget. Thanks. Yeah, there are great resources. So first of all, I have a yarn comparison chart and I put a link in the description on that. So what the yarn comparison chart is it tells you where the yarn falls in weight and you can look at a yarn label. Let's take this one for example and it will say that it's um, it will give you the gauge. So this gauge is three to five stitches, uh, six stitches per inch on size three to five needle and it also gives you the Craft Yarn Council's rating system which right here you can see this yarn ball anytime you see this yarn skein you know that's the craft yarn council assigned number for it and number two means sport weight yarn so you can go and find any sport weight yarn and it should work pretty well what i do recommend is that you stick with um, the type of fiber it is so this one is <clears throat> A merino wool baby alpaca and silk. So if you stuck with a merino wool blend, you should be just fine getting the same type of gauge. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. <coughs> you should be fine getting the same gauge. You'll want to gauge it up to make sure, but that is your kind of go-to. However, there's also other tools online to make things easier. You can use um, Ravelry. So let's say you have a pattern you like. You can go to Ravelry. Ravelry is a free service if you're not familiar with it. You can type in the pattern that you are looking for or the yarn and you can find, it'll tell you what the weight is and then you'll be able to find similar 
yarns that will work with that project. There's also another awesome tool that I use all the time. It's called yarnsub.com. And this is a genius service. You can type in a yarn and it will tell you what other yarns are available on the market that are similar to that yarn. And it will even rank them. It'll say this yarn is like 98% close to the yarn that you had, or it's 75% close to it. And it'll tell you why, like, oh, it might be a little thinner or thicker, or the contents off a little bit, but it's a great tool. I love Yarn Sub. I love Ravelry for this tool, for this purpose, and definitely go get my um, yarn conversion chart. And um, my next question is from Bethany. Bethany wants to know tips for lace weight yarn. Um, well, Knitting with lace, you know, it's a very, very thin yarn, but surprisingly, it's often knitted at a much larger needle. So if you were thinking, okay, I have to knit lace on a, like a zero needle, you don't. Most of the time it's knitted on like a three, five needle so that it gives you this open airy look. And a lot of times, like one of my favorite um, lace weight yarn is Kid Silk Mohair. Um, because the mohair fills in the lace, you get this beautiful haloed effect. So it's definitely one that you'll want to try if you're knitting lace. You also want to use a sharp pointed needle, like these, these are sharp. It's a nice sharp needle. And one of the best sharp needles are the Chowgu stilettos. If you haven't tried those, they are mwah perfect for knitting lace. So I put a link to those in the description below for you. And a lot of times with lace, you're dealing with a lot of patterns. So to keep track of the patterns, I recommend using stitch markers in between the repeats. So let's say you're, you've got like 200 stitches and every 20 uh, stitches is a repeat. I would put a stitch marker in between every 20 stitches because what happens is you can isolate a problem if it's over 20 stitches rather than trying to figure out what the heck you did over 200 stitches. So those are my quick lace knitting tips for you. Okay. Oh, wait, they're not. I have more. You can also add a lifeline. A lifeline is just a strand that you run you pick up a strand, you run it um, in between the yarn and the needle, and you let it hang there. So it would just run right here, and then you keep on knitting, you ignore that lifeline, but if you make a mistake, that lifeline is hanging, you know, it could be this far down, but if you make a mistake, you only have to rip down this far rather than ripping down all the way. And it's a lot easier to get the stitches back on the needle if you have a lifeline right there. So, um, and if you're using a chart, keep track on the chart. Um, there are tools. In fact, I have some new tools coming out, tool uh, videos coming out soon. And one of it shows uh, a great tool for knitting with charts. Uh, so you wanna keep track row by row, either by marking it off, uh, using a pencil, using a ruler, or some um, washi tape or sticky tape, just to go mark off your rows. And blocking is essential when you're knitting with lace. Okay, so next question is from Liana. What do I look for in a yarn to help me know whether it will work well for well whether it will work well for cables or overall textures? I know I can make swatches after I buy, but what will help me decide before making my purchase? Okay, so I have my some really awesome examples. In fact, my favorite, you want to look for a smooth, plain yarn with a really good twist. So one of my absolute favorite yarns is UU Yarns. And you can see this yarn has a really nice twist to it. And that twist, and the, oh, this is also a merino wool. You want to look for natural, um, a lot of animal fibers do really well with this. Um, but wools and merinos are excellent for um, good stitch definition. 
So this has a great twist to it and it will bounce back. So as you're knitting it and you're putting texture in, the bounce will provide lots of thick and thin and uh, not thick and thin, but um, definition to your stitches. Um, <clears throat> this one that I'm working on right here is Paragon Sport. It's a knit pick yarn and look at the twist on that. You can see that is going to give you excellent stitch definition. So that's what you want to look for. If you're looking, I would avoid like a cotton. Alpaca does not really have much give unless it's blended with something else. But you want to look for like a bouncy, squishy yarn with a nice twist and that's going to do, serve you well every time. Also, one other note I made, avoid single ply yarns. So if it's just a like, hang on, I've got another example right here. So I just used this in a half pie shawl that if you haven't gone and watched that video and gotten the free pattern, it's been crazy popular. Um, <clears throat> I think we've had 45,000 views in a week on that one. So if you haven't, go look for my half pie shawl. Um, this, uh, this is a single ply, so there's no yarn strands twisted together. It's just one ply of yarn. And I would not recommend these for um, knitting lots of texture. They just don't, they don't catch the light the same way or bounce the same way. So that I would avoid for um, cables. <clears throat> And uh, the next question is from Elizabeth. Elizabeth says, I'm looking for a DK weight yarn with good stitch definition. Does cotton yarn typically have the best stitch definition? What do you use cotton yarn for? And why do some not like knitting with cotton yarn? So cotton yarn is kind of like the bane of knitter's existence. So it's like you need to have it because it's really great for knitting in the summer or if you live somewhere where it's um you know warm weather most of the year it makes great really nice sweaters uh you can do home projects with it of course we love dishcloths with it however there's no give with cotton none whatsoever and it can be really hard on your hands in fact i was just watching a video from i think it's le petite crochet something similar to that she was just talking about she makes a lot of um, stuffed animals and she was knitting with cotton and really having problems with her hands so she switched to um, other fibers wools things like that and she said it made a huge difference in the problems that she was having with her arms and hands so I do use cotton for, um, I've got some little stuffed animals that are coming out soon. Those I use cotton for when I'm doing dishcloths. Um, if I were to make a placemat, a uh, really cute, you could make a little cotton tee. Great for those things, but on an ongoing regular basis, cotton is not the ideal for great stitch definition um, or or just like longevity with knitting because it's tough on your hands. Most plant-based fibers tend to be, tend to not have much give and that can be a problem on your hands. So, <clears throat> um, I made some notes here. Uh, I also put a link. I have like 11 questions you always wanted to know about cotton yarn, but we're afraid to ask. It's a blog post and it's in the link is in the description below. So check that out and it'll give you lots more on cotton yarn and cotton yarn knitting. Okay, Janelle asked, why does cotton yarn untwist into separate strings when I'm knitting it? Well, most cotton yarn is plied and since it doesn't have very much give, it also doesn't have any memory. So that's why it unravels so easily or it splits easily because these yarns, it's like you twist them and boy, they want to stay twisted together. They, they like being together. But cotton is like, eh, no, I'm just going to flop around and do my own thing. So it's just the nature of the beast. So if you like working with it, just keep going and the, the 
the um, splits won't bother you, you know, just work with it. And um, there's, I don't know, I haven't found too much. I, I've been using um, Knit Picks Dishy Cotton and uh, Premier Home Cotton. And I find those two don't split that much. They, they uh, hold up pretty well. And in fact, here. Here's the Premier Home Cotton. I've just used this to make these crochet mushrooms that are coming out on a new channel that I'm starting, which I will be giving you info on very soon. I'm starting a crochet YouTube channel. So if you're a crocheter, there's gonna be lots of really good stuff coming. So this one does not split very much, I would recommend. But as you can see, here, you can see the strands. It's just the nature of cotton. It's just the way it is. Um, so I'd leave a little bit longer tail to weave that in uh, when you're done knitting it. Okay, so <clears throat> the next question um, is from Lynn, but before I see some questions starting to come in here. So what I'm trying to do, I wanna get through all of the questions that I have here and then open things up so that if you have additional questions, you can ask them at the end uh, because it's too hard for me to flip back and forth and read what's on the screen here. Um, although I will answer super chats as soon as I see them if I have any. So, okay, let's go on with the next question from Lynn. How do I change a worsted weight yarn to a sport or DK weight yarn in a pattern called for a worsted wage weight to get gauge? Is it possible? I have a wonderful sweater calling for a worsted weight and I would like to do it in a lighter weight yarn. Now, this is a question I can, I'm gonna give you several different answers, but this is a question that comes in very often from knitters and if you're not a designer, it's hard to know that there's a lot of work that went into planning the pattern uh, and sizing it properly with that yarn. So to quickly, to just substitute another yarn is going to completely change the drape of the project. It's going to change the number of stitches you need to use. It changes so much of it. Um, that you're almost redesigning an entire sweater. And unless you know how to do that or learn how to do that, it's it's really difficult to do. Um, so I always recommend find the pattern first and then go find the yarn. There's thousands, I think there's like hundred over a hundred thousand sweater patterns alone on Ravelry. And then not to mention the rest of the world. There are so many sweater patterns out there. I'm sure you can find one that fits the type of yarn you wanna work with. However, there are some things you can do to tweak this pattern a little bit, to, to tweak the yarn rather, to make it work for your project. <clears throat> so to get the same gauge, you'll need to use a larger needle or you could hold two strands together and then try to get the gauge with that. Um, so this is sport, and if you're trying to knit a worsted weight yarn, you just knit with two strands at a time and try to get the same gauge as the worsted. Uh, because if you were to knit this just by itself, sport is much, much thinner than worsted, and you're going to get a very open, airy project, and it could end up looking flimsy or droopy. So you have to decide just Try a gauge swatch. If you like it single like this, go ahead and knit it. If you don't, um, then try doubling it or try to find a different yarn to match it. So, that, you know, try to find a worsted weight yarn to go with that. Um, <clears throat> okay, I answered all that. So that's your answer to the, you know, the short answer to the knitting question. Now in my um, yarn boot camp, um, I have a 30 day, 30 day boot camp that shows you how to become a better knitter. And one of the big things I go into is how to actually adjust a pattern for your yarn. And it's a long process. Um, 
But if you want to do the math on it, I do provide that in my yarn boot camp, in my 30-day um, boot camp. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to go into knitting techniques. Um, <clears throat> Okay, my next question here is from Soapy again. I seem to be having a problem with the first stitch on the needle at the beginning of the row. It's also always looser than the others and I cannot tighten it. I do not know why this is happening or how to fix it. Well, this happens very often. It's a very common problem for um, new knitters and it's a tension problem. It's a tension problem and one other thing. <clears throat> so, when you're knitting, if you tend to pull your needles apart quite often, what you're doing is you're kind of, you know, since I told you this is a continuous strand of yarn all the way through, when you're pulling your stitches apart after each stitch, or while you're knitting, you're pulling it like this, what happens is you end up with a buildup of yarn at the end. It's you know hard to see until you actually get to the end of your row and then you've got this really loose loop. Well, that's why, because you're holding these too far apart. Also, um, so when I'm knitting, I want you to see, I'm <clears throat> but I know a lot of times if people are using the throw method, they're gonna pull their needle all the way back here and go in and then wrap it around. And that, and then they pull it apart again, like that. That's gonna cause that buildup. And it also causes some uneven tension. So those are the two issues that are causing it, but it's not something I would worry too much about. It's something that's going to correct itself eventually as you become a more skilled knitter. I'm not used to talking this much, so <laughs> need some water. Um, all right, so the next question is from Marsha. When casting on the knitting method, is it considered your first row? So this is like a, a long-standing question with knitters, and um, I actually wrote a blog post on it years ago, but I kind of have varying ideas on whether I count it or not. <clears throat> um, some knitters always count it, other knitters don't. The general rule of thumb I've seen is if you count it, then count it con uh, consistently. So if you're making a sweater and you decide, okay, I'm counting this as my cast, up, my, my knitted edge as my row one, make sure you do that throughout your entire sweater so that you're getting it the way it's supposed to be even. Um, other people don't count it. So if you're not gonna count it, don't count it through the entire sweater so that it's nice and even. Um, and the other problem comes in is, what if row one has a stitch pattern to it? You know, what if it's a rib or a, um, you know, a lace that has some yarn overs? Well, that's gonna throw off your knitting because you've counted that as row one. So what do you do there? So. When in cases like that, I don't count it, but if I were just knitting the cast on and doing stockinette, I probably would count it. And when I'm measuring, I always count that the cast on as part of the overall length of the project. When it'll say, measure 12 inches from the beginning of your work, I always count all the way down to the edge. So I hope that helps. And I put a link in the description for you on um, my blog post on this topic. And I'd like to see what do you think, you know, put it in the comments below. I'd like to see if you, um, if you count that, if you do knitting cast, knitted cast ons, whether you count them as your first row. Okay, Cynthia's question is, I'm looking to knit lace edging on fingerless mitts. How and what pattern? There's actually a very good book from um, it, from Vogue Knitting, a Stictionary. I think it's Stictionary Six, Lace and Edging. I actually put a link in the description below so that you can look up that book. It's got all different kinds of edgings. It'll give you ideas for tons of projects. You can put lace edgings on sweaters and um, mittens and 
shawls. So check that out. And it, it's not just lace edging. There's over 200 different edgings in there. So it's a great resource to have in your knitting library. Sandra's question is, what decrease is the best decrease for the crown of a hat? Well, I would say 95% of the time, I always just do a knit two together because while you're knitting, it creates a spiral and you get that spiral shape that looks really good with a knit two together. Now you could have something that's a pattern and it might, the designer might specify for something else, but just a nice even crown, a knit two together is going to give you a really nice result. Okay, Alice's question is, how to weave 100% cotton yarn in at the end of a blanket after changing colors? Well, you are in luck because I just finished a striped baby blanket. It's one of my latest videos that came out. Um, I put a link in the description and in that video towards the end, I show you exactly how I weave in yet our yarn ends. Let me get up, do I have the blanket here? I do have the blanket, let me get it. Okay, I just made this. Now this is a wool yarn. It's um, UU Heathers Heathers, as you can see here. And it has color changes, but I do show you, and it's gonna be the same with cotton or any other yarn on weaving in the yarn ends. I will show you how to weave in the yarn ends with the different colors. So go check that out and you will not see the yarn ends at all by the time you're done. In fact, weaving in yarn ends used to be my least favorite thing in the world. I would knit sweaters, design project, send them into yarn companies and expect them to weave in the yarn ends because I hated doing it so much. Um, now, that I know the proper way to weave in yarn ends. It's one of my favorite activities. It's very rhythmic. So go check this out. I show you how to do it in a contrasting color so you can really see what I'm doing and mwah, you will have the most beautiful yarn ends that no one will see because they're perfect and they're not gonna come undone. So my next question is um, from Say, oh, we did Sandra, we did Alice. Debbie, I came across a video of Russian style knitting. Do you have any comments on making that, on how to make that style of knitting? Well, I didn't really know what Russian knitting was until you asked. And so I went and watched a couple of videos on it and guess what? I absolutely love it because it's exactly the same as continental knitting. That's how I knit. I couldn't get enough of continental knitting. Russian knitting, they're the exact same thing. In fact, I've made, oh, four or five videos on continental knitting. I put the first one in the description below. It's just such a nice rhythmic method of knitting. It's the way I knit everything. And it allows you to knit faster. You have more even tension. If you're a, cro if you've learned to crochet first, it's almost like crocheting with your knitting needles. Uh, so I can't say enough about it. In fact, I have even more um, continental knitting, knitting videos coming out in the near future. So go check out my link on it. And um, I even have another video that will give you tips, my top tips for that. So definitely check that out. Okay, question from Ginny in Georgia. Is there a video available for Noble Threads edging on the Jane A shawl? So Noble Threads is actually a whole nother website. I checked out her website. She's got some really beautiful designs. In fact, the Jane A shawl is a really pretty garter stitch shawl with kind of like little a little scalloped edge to it. And um, I would reach out to her. I put a link to the website next to your name, Jenny and Georgia, so you can contact her and see if she has directions for that. And the next question I have is from Dorothy. I have a shawl pattern that says to twist the first three stitches, but only knit the first stitch to create a twist. Do I twist away from me or towards me or does it matter? Um, 
I have to say, I'd have to see more information on this. And I got a couple of other questions in here that are um, that I'm not going to include today because they're very detailed like this. Um, so I'd have to know more information to be able to solve your knitting question. I don't know if this is a cable, um, whether you're supposed to slip the stitches to another needle before stitching it. I just need more info to be able to answer. <clears throat> okay. Um, Pat's question is, can you show us how to knit with the magic loop? I actually have a really excellent video by a top designer. It's on my website. Her name is Megan Schmaltz. She is uh, very skilled at knitting and she shows how to do it way better than I would. So you can go check that out. I put a link in the description so you can check out how to do the magic loop. <clears throat> okay, next question is from Audrey. Audrey wants to know, when knitting on double pointed needles, how can I eliminate looser tension in between needles? So what you need to do is give a little tug when you're transferring from one needle to the other. It might almost feel a little, um, like you're being a little insane on pulling on it, but just give it a nice little tug and that will help with the transition to eliminate a split when you're changing from one double pointed needle to the other. In addition, um, Sheep and Stitch has a whole little tutorial on other problems that you might encounter or tips rather when you're knitting with double pointed needles. So I've provided a link in the description for that. <clears throat> Another little water break. Okay. <clears throat> Next up is Bridget, and she wants to know what's the importance of a long tail? Well, a long tail allows you to, if you're referring to the cast on, it allows you to do a long tail cast on because it takes yarn, you're just setting, basically setting aside yarn before you start casting on your stitches, and then you use that long tail along with the yarn that's on attached to the ball to make the cast on. Um, so that's the reason for a long tail cast on. And if you're making, leaving a long tail for your knitting, for example, right here, I have a long tail. That's so I have enough yarn to weave in my yarn ends. I always leave a four to six inch tail. So depending on which question you're asking, those are, they're your answers for both. And the long tail cast on is my favorite cast on. I use this, I would say 90% of the time. It's a good go-to cast on. It's a nice stretchy cast on and it's sturdy. Um, if you're just doing a loop e-wrap cast on, it, it breaks apart. It doesn't allow you to have nice even stitches. Well, the long tail cast on is kind of like a next level cast on and it eliminates all those problems and I've provided a link on how to do that in the description. <clears throat> okay, so Anna's question is, should you wash your gauge swatch before counting the stitches and rows? I had a cotton yarn that was similar in stitches, but the number of rows changed a lot. So the answer is, if you plan on washing your swatch, I mean your garment or whatever you're making, yes, you want to wash your swatch the same way you would launder the garment after you made it. <clears throat> it can change it quite a bit, especially like you said with the cotton, you get a lot of stretch with cotton. It's just the nature of it. Um, but most knitting now, this if it's a sweater that's knitted from side to side, so you're knitting up and down, the, the um, length of the stitch is going to really matter. The rows will matter. However, if you're knitting uh, anything else, most of the time they will say knit to this point or knit to that point. They won't usually give you rows. The rows don't matter as much as the stitch gauge. Um, and I also have a, a um, blog post on does the stitch, what's up with row gauge and does it matter and how you deal with it. So that is a link in the description for you on, on working with row gauge. 
The next question is from Dorothy. Wanting to add colors to my blankets, how do I do the slide method to add a contrasting color throughout the blanket without cutting the yarn every other row? So there's a really good tutorial on this. It's from a company called Notions with a K, K-N-O-T-I-O-N-S. I've provided a link below. They show you exactly how to do it, and it's a really easy way to put a stripe in your project. So you're, if you're knitting on straight needles, what you would do is you'd slide the yarn, you'd slide your stitches all the way down to the other end, pick up the new color, and then knit it. And then when you get, you'll get back to the other end of the row, you'll be back here again, and then you can pick up this yarn and just start knitting it. So it's a really fun, easy way to add color or one row stripes to your knitting. Okay. So uh, the next question is from Marie. My cables turn the opposite way when they were written as, as opposed to the pattern, apparently because I knit left-handed. What else should I look for as a lefty knitter? So I'm a lefty knitter and I reverse so many things, but this is a cable and my cables twist the opposite direction from a right-handed knitter. But what you can do if you want your cables to match what the pattern says, if it says put the um, slip, you know, cable in front, you're gonna put your cable in the back. If it says put the cable in the back, you're gonna put the cable in the front. You're just gonna do exactly the opposite of what it says for where those stitches should go and it will re reverse them. And that's all you have to do. There's nothing else. Now, one thing I notice is when I'm doing hats, my uh, spiral goes the opposite direction from the pattern. And you could change that, but I don't think it really ma makes much difference. So I don't do that. I just leave that go. Um, it's only because you're knitting mirror image. So I would just let it go and be part of your, that's the way it is, except for the cables if you want those to match. And also if you're knitting um, a chart, you're gonna read your chart from starting at the left, whereas a right-hand person starts their chart from the bottom right. You're gonna start yours from the bottom left. Those are my big lefty tips. Okay, Sylvia asks, Will you demonstrate the method for picking up stitches in a future video? Sylvia, yes for you. I will definitely do that. I've already added it to my list, so it will be coming soon. Terry wants to know, when grafting two pieces together, how would you treat knits as opposed to purls and twisted stitches? Okay, so Very Pink Knits has a really great tutorial on this. I've provided it in the link. She shows you how to graft using both knits and purls. She does it with um, a, a ribbed pattern. So that will answer your questions on, on doing it. And she's very good at these, at this tutorial. It's a really good one. Okay, Lynn wants to know how a yarn over is done after a purl stitch. So I've actually got another um, video for you and this one is from Leisure Arts. They show you, if you check the link in the description, there's a very good video on how to do a yarn over after a purl stitch. They actually show you how to do a yarn over after a purl and before a purl, after a knit and before a purl. So they've got all your questions answered. So check that link out. And then Claire asks, I would like to enlarge a mini shawl that I knitted. Can I just start adding to the bind off row? It's a simple bind off or would I need to take out the binding? So if you were to just start picking up where the bind off is, you will have a ridge in your knitting and it might look a little funky. So what I recommend for a much cleaner and more professional look is to take out that binding and as you're taking it out, just do it stitch by stitch. Don't just like rip it out. Do it stitch by stitch and put your needle in that those stitches as you're binding off, as you're picking them up. And then you're ready to just attach your yarn to the end and continue knitting as if nothing happened and no one will know. Okay, um, Rita asks a question. 
How to neatly add a new ball of yarn. Is it best to weave in your yarn ends with a tapestry needle and weave them or weave them in as you knit? I have problems with these two techniques and dread when it's time to add a new ball of yarn and weave in the yarn ends. So this blanket, one of the things I show you how to do is attach a new skein of yarn. And one of the problems people have is that they think that they have to set down the old yarn, pick up the new yarn and start knitting. And then what you end up with like floppy, um, a floppy stitch or a bunch of stitches every time you hit that, that um, color change. You don't have to do that. You can do a simple tie on, it'll anchor that new yarn and, and then weave in the yarn ends. When you're done with your project, I just pick up my needle, I do them all at once, quick and easy. Um, kind of like an assembly line. I just weave in all my yarn ends at the same time. But go watch this video, the striped baby blanket, and I'll show you exactly how to do those techniques. And hopefully you won't dread doing those anymore. It'll turn into a fun project. Uh, it's very um, cathartic to weave in the yarn ends when you know how to weave them in properly. Okay, so the next question is from Colleen. Colleen wants to know, she seems to add or subtract stitches without knowing how she did it. How can I prevent this? So get in the habit of counting every stitch of every row when you begin. Um, so if this project is supposed to have 27 stitches, I go and I count 27 stitches at the end of the row to make sure that I didn't make a mistake because if you're counting the stitches after every row, you're, you won't find the mistake down here. You'll be able to find it right here and catch it in that row. And a lot of times what will happen with people is, <clears throat> remember we talked about that loose end stitch? Well, you've got that loose end stitch problem. And what happens sometimes is that end is so loose that you end up looping it over the needle and it ends up looking like two stitches instead of having that in the front where it's supposed to be. So that is a very common way of ending up with extra stitches. Another thing is you end up with, um, you don't take the stitch, the last stitch off the needle all the way, or you end up wrapping the yarn and get a yarn over. So if you find you're knitting and you have this like strand that doesn't seem to be attached to anything and it's sitting diagonally on your needle, that's exactly what happened there. So, <clears throat> The more you can identify those problems, the easier it will be to correct them. <clears throat> um, okay, so those are my big answers on that. Now we are on to knitting problems. And wow, we are winding away. We only have a few questions on knitting problems and other, and then I'll be able to answer your questions. I know we're at one o'clock right now. I wanna get these done in about 10 minutes and then I'll open it up to answering any of your questions. Okay, so the next question is from Ellen. I'm knitting a flower and I have six stitches and the directions say, I'm gonna show you, it's a knit one yarn over knit one. What am I knitting? Why am I not getting 11 stitches? So here's how this pattern is written. It has an asterisk and then the instruction knit one yarn over and then an asterisk and then a knit one. So sometimes knitter knitting designers are so used to what is supposed to happen that they forget to spell out the instructions to a new knitter. And if you look at the math on this, you have six stitches and basically you're doing a yarn over in between each stitch on this. So that's gonna be five yarn overs. So it'll be knit one, yarn over, knit one, yarn over, knit one, until you get to the last stitch and you knit that last stitch. So that's how you're doing that and that does add up to 11 stitches. My guess is that what you're doing is you're doing knit one, yarn over, knit, you're going, knit one, yarn over, knit one, knit one, yarn over, knit one, and that will screw up your project. But what you wanna do is read the asterisk. <clears throat> you do what's in between the two asterisks, 
until you get to that last stitch and then you'll knit that last stitch. So <clears throat> just do this, knit one, yarn over, knit one, and you're gonna just put one yarn over in between each yarn, each knit stitch. That's all there is to it. So I hope that works out for you. Let me know in the comments if you're still having problems with it. <clears throat> okay, Mary's question is, <coughs> I am knitting a fair isle vest and I'm having problems following the chart when doing decreases for the armhole. After the decrease, the number of stitches stated, where do I resume my place in the chart? It's a little confusing. Is there a tutorial that would help me? And actually, my friend over at Very Pink Knits, she's got a very good tutorial on um, reading a chart with fair isle and decreases. So I've provided a link in the description for you. Okay, Dina's question is, finishing a triangle scarf in stockinette stitch. What can I do to finish the last row to keep it from rolling? Well, this is the hat that I'm working on in stockinette stitch. And look at this. It's rolling like there's no tomorrow. And look at how long it is. And it's still rolling up like crazy. <clears throat> that is the nature of stockinette. You will have that no matter what. You can block it. It's going to roll. That's the way stocking it is. So what you can do is you can do a garter stitch edge, which is going to be, I would recommend about four to five rows of just knitting, no purling. So leave enough yarn so that when you get towards the end of your project, your shawl, you can just knit for five or six rows, straight garter stitch, and that will eliminate that. There are also some edging. So I talked about edge stitches, um, <clears throat> the stitchinary book that will provide some really good edge stitches. You could put a beautiful edging on um, and that will eliminate the problem. Uh, so those are my answers on rolling. So Jackie, Jackie's question is, she made a pair of socks with Croy sock yarn and 64 stitches. They have no negative ease. Should I use smaller needles or less stitches? These were my first socks, two at a time, toe up. So yes, you definitely need to make some adjustments and I would not change the number of stitches. I'd go down in the needle size. It sounds to me like you are too loose for this um, because I looked up the Croy sock yarn and it is a, um, it's a yarn that ha should have quite a bit of bounce and give to it. So if you're, if it's flopping around and not giving you that um, stretch that you need, I would go down one or two needle sizes and see how that works. So you don't have to re-knit the entire sock. I would go and cast on and knit maybe an inch or two and take a look at it. If it's like a rib top, you should see that, that you're getting some stretch or bounce to it before you continue on. See if that works. Okay, Trisha's question is, how do you correct drop stitches on the edge of your work when each row alternates from knit to purl stitches? Okay, I'm actually, it's like you read my mind, I have a tool that I absolutely love. Um, you can fix this with a crochet hook, but I have a tool that's a little bit better. I'm doing a video on this very soon, so um, just stay tuned. It's coming on how to fix dropped stitches. Linda's question is, I have started knitting a shawl, garter and eyelet from your tutorial, and I have used straight needles, but because all my stitches are bunched up, I can't see how big it is when I stop and cast off. I was wondering if you knew how many stitches you had on the size you made when you cast off. Wow, you are putting a lot of stitches on a straight needle. I'm assuming you're on a 14 inch. I think when I knitted that shawl, I was on a 40 or a 60 inch circular needle and I ended up with 313 stitches on my needle. I know that knitting on circular needles can be scary when you haven't tried it before but the advantage of circular needles is they allow you to hold so many stitches. This is going to be an entire shawl in here and then you're not carrying the weight when you're trying to knit you're holding this whole shawl up, the entire thing when you're trying to knit. But when you're on circular needles, 
this, this is holding it so it can sit comfortably in your lap and it can hold the weight of all those stitches. You don't have to worry about them being crammed. So I would highly recommend trying circular needles because they do make such a difference. And when you've got circular needles, you can lay it out and look and see what it's looking like because I, I was on a, I do believe I was on a 60 inch. You can hold up the 60 inch needle and see it'll bend to the shape of the shawl and you can see, oh, this is looking beautiful as a triangle. I can see the shape, I can see how large it is and it really is a game changer. So that's what I'm doing with this shawl that's going to be coming out soon. This one's going to take up a lot of space and I'll be able to really identify the shape of it because of that. So. Again, it was 313 stitches, and I really hope you give circular needles a try for this. Okay, now we're on to other questions, and we're rolling right along, so I'll be able to an answer questions if you have any online. So Lynn's question said, oh, Lynn says, I don't have a question. I just want to compliment you and thank you for your postings. I'm a struggling knitter and finding your lessons and patterns very good for me. I am so glad to hear that. And if you have questions, please, feel free to add them. There's a link in the description. If you have questions for me, I'll either do a new video or, um, you know, if it's not per pertaining to a particular pattern that's nobody else is doing, I will be answering questions in the lives and in, um, in individual videos. So thank you for that. Carla, how do you make baby blankets larger? Well, I have an ultimate tool for you. It's called my ultimate baby blanket guide. It tells you how to knit baby blankets at all different sizes, what standard baby blanket sizes are. Is it a, um, a car seat blanket, a crib blanket? There's like three or four sizes and I show you how to knit those at different yarn weights. So it's like an ultimate guide uh, and how takes you through the steps to do it yourself. Check the description below and there you'll be able to download my guide. And there's even yarns on there that you might want to try for knitting baby blankets. Okay, Elizabeth's question. Okay. Elizabeth says she's developing arthritis and other ailments in her hands and fingers, making it difficult to knit. She's gone from a person who knitted for hours in the evening to an occasional moment of knitting enjoyment here and there. What exercises and stretches would you suggest to help alleviate this affliction? Well, I don't know if you heard me earlier, um, La Petite Crochet, has had problems with, she was knitting with cotton too much and it really caused a lot of problems in her hands. It was giving her tendonitis. She she went to her doctor and talked about it and she changed things up and she gives a lot of tips that helped her. So I've put a link in the description to that video because um, it was really informative. And then there's also some exercises that you can do um, to help uh, with your hands. And I provided a link in that, in the description for that as well. But I would also talk to your doctor because I know that they have, um, there are little, there are wristbands that you can get. Um, you can use some of those, um, those heat bombs, you know, that you rub on, like icy hot, something like that. But I would check with your doctor and see if they have any tips or ideas because they often do. Uh, I know that arthritis is something my grandmother was a lifelong knitter and it was something that she struggled with as well. So I really feel your pain and I want you to be able to knit for as long as possible. Uh, the next question is from Soapy. She asks, she's making a shawl and a cake and she went from straight needles to circular needles with a hundred at a hundred stitches. Now all her stitches are uneven and she had to pull out rows and rows of stitches. Stop, talk about frustrated. She's not really smiling, but hanging in there. Okay, so I have a few things for you. Number one, make sure you're getting the stitch onto the shaft of the needle. So a lot of times when you're stressed 
and you're knitting, you knit onto this point and then that's it. And then you're shoving the stitches up here and they haven't really gotten to the right size. And then when you drop them down onto the circular needle, they go back to where they were because they've been stretched over this. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you are getting every stitch onto this wide part of the needle and you don't wanna tighten after each stitch. Just the tension is the tension. So don't pull up every time you knit. Just let it, your stitches should be able to glide on the needle like this. And look at, look at how smooth that is when I glide off and on my circular needle. That's the way it should be. Now, I also wouldn't worry too much. Don't rip out um, rows and rows of stitches because blocking will alleviate and change a lot of that problem. So things could look a little bit wonky, but once you block it, remember this is one never ending strand. So it has some fluidity to it. Uh, go ahead and keep on going. But like I said, you wanna loosen up your tension. You're, it sounds like you're way too tight and don't pull up every time you finish a stitch. Let the stitch be on the needle and glide like this. This is your goal. Um, <clears throat> and another thing is, as you knit, you will improve. I bet if you go and look at a shawl that you've knitted, and let's say it's a shawl or a scarf, you can see improvements from the very beginning of it to the end of it. You will see, if you match up those ends, I bet you'll see a change in more consistent knitting. So it happens incrementally. You don't always notice it, but before you know it, your knitting will look like that. It will look beautiful without even having to be blocked. Uh, <clears throat> so just keep on going. This is something every new knitter struggles with. Okay, the next question is from Joel. How did you learn to teach so well on video format? Thank you so much, Joel. Other than face-to-face -face class at my local yarn store, I learned the most from your online tutorials and boot camps. You have a wonderful ability to teach online and I am not an online learner. Well, I do think this happened from, uh, you know, 20 years of teaching. I taught in my store every day and you learn about teaching other people, you know, with their knitting styles. And you also learn how to break down the knitting process to make it easier for someone who's never done it before. And I just try to take things step by step and think like a new knitter all the time. Uh, so thank you for that compliment. In fact, I don't know if you've noticed, I just finished a very expensive and um, long uh, YouTube video um, course so that I could provide you better knitting videos. And that's my goal is to provide more helpful, more entertaining, and better videos to help you become a better knitter. So thank you so much, Joel, for noticing that. I really appreciate it. Judy, I made, Judy's question is, I made a simple baby sweater a few years ago. Now I cannot find the pattern anywhere. All I have is a picture. Any suggestions? Okay, well, there are a few suggestions I have. One is to search Ravelry. Um, you know, there are thousands and thousands of baby sweaters out there. If you can't find the exact sweater, I mean, you could sit down and count the stitches and try to re-engineer it, but there, most baby sweaters are either top down, bottom up, and, and it's not that hard to find something that's similar that's going to strike your fancy just as much as this other pattern that you made. So I would check Ravelry if you can't find the pattern on there. I'm sure you'll find another suitable pattern and it's a lot easier than trying to decipher it yourself. And look at the key elements of the sweater so that you can find it. Like I said, top down, bottom up, they're all generally the same basic construction. And then Rebecca asked, I signed up and paid for several classes at Noble Knits, so the, all the boot camps. Do at Noble Knits University, that's noblenitsu.com. And she said, um, due to several health issues, she's not been able to take them. Is there a timeline on taking them? I currently have a broken arm and can't knit for at least six weeks. Oh my goodness, my heart goes out to you to not be able to knit for six weeks. Well, I wish you speedy recovery. And guess what? 
My knitting boot camps are available for you forever. There, it will be able to, you'll be able to access it at any time. Once you're healed up and ready, they will be there for you. And if you haven't checked out my um, Noble Knit Boot Camps, be sure to check them out because there's shawls, um, scarves. Oh gosh, what else do we have? We have a 30 day to become a better knitter. Um, there's a yarn boot camp that answers all your questions on yarn and choosing yarns and matching up the right yarns for the patterns. Uh, so check those out. They're affordable. I rolled back prices on a lot of them uh, towards the end of last year and people seem to love them at those prices. So they range anywhere from $19 to um, I think it's $49 or $59 for the 30 day. So check those out. You'll learn a lot and they are not live classes. They are meant for you to knit at your own pace and you can access them any time of day or night. And there's a lot of free printables and project ideas within those courses for you as well. So that's all of the questions. Now I'm going to turn around here and see if you have any questions in the next 10 minutes or so. So, it says my chat is disconnected. Let's see. So if you have questions, can you put them in the comments? Let's see. Is there a way to connect a, I, I'm, looks like I'm gonna have to look at them here. Is there a way to um, turn a crochet pattern or knitting pattern? If you could ask that question again, I'm not seeing it. It went away on my screen here and I'm not seeing it in my screen over here. Okay. Okay, and please start your question with a question or with que the word question. Is there a way to convert a crochet pattern to a knitting pattern? Yes, there is, and there are several guides on it. In fact, I know there's some books on Amazon on this topic. I would recommend searching that and you'll be able to find that. Okay, I have problems with keeping tension with intarsia. Well, you know what? Welcome to the club. That is one of the hardest things to do. Um, I would recommend when you're doing intarsia, tie on that um, first strand so that you don't have um, so you don't have a loosey goosey strand when you're knitting intarsia. Just tie it on. You can always undo the tie. I make either just a, a quick half knot or a um, square knot, and then I undo my um, knots before I weave in the yarn ends, but that will help get rid of that problem and help you maintain more even stitches. Okay, tips on apply. Can I border a blanket? Yes, you can border a blanket. You can uh, pick up stitches and, and put a border on that way. Um, when you're doing corners though, you'd have to miter the corner or what you could do is pick up and knit each strip on its own and then you won't have that problem. What I would do is if I were picking up for a border and I had already knitted it and I don't want to do my dirt corners um, between cotton and dog uh, I would do the bottom border, the top border, and then go add the side borders one at a time. That will give you a nice edging without having to deal with the corners. Okay so this person somebody just asked for some reason I can't see your questions here, they're disconnected. Let's see. <clears throat> okay. I don't know why my live chat's acting up over here. <clears throat> okay, here, I have your questions now. Um, how do you decide between continental and English knitting on a project? Well, I knit everything continental. It's it's really not a matter of choosing one or the other. I just knit everything that way. Um, I find it, for me, everything is easier with continental knitting. It's a qu great question because I've never actually even thought of it. Um, so the way you hold your, it's really just the way you hold your yarn. It's not really a different method of knitting. It's you're, because in actuality, 
The stitches are getting made exactly the same way. It's just that how you are holding the yarn is a little different. So go ahead and use whichever method you feel more comfortable with. <clears throat> okay, so um, Helen asks, and I'm sorry, that was from Rebecca. <coughs> Helen asks, have you ever written knitting books and love your videos. I look forward to the knitted baby blanket using UU yarns. Well, thank you. I have actually written four books on knitting and crocheting. You can search me on Amazon under Nancy Queen. Um, I actually have links on about to them on my About Me page. I think I have them on YouTube, but I definitely have them, I know for sure, on my blog on the About Me page. <clears throat> I've written The Chicks with Sticks Guide to Knitting, the Chicks with Sticks Guide to Crochet, and Fast and Fun Crochet for Babies and Toddlers. And a I did a, a leisure arts book years ago on crocheting projects. <coughs> I don't know if that one's still in print. <coughs> However, yes, I have written books and the, um, the Crochet Guides, um, Chicks with Sticks Guide to Crochet and Chicks with Sticks Guide to Knitting are my two most popular books. And uh, I designed them with my partner at the time, Mary Ellen. And um, we, what we did was we designed projects that would introduce something as you go, and then you learn the skills. Kind of like what I do here on the YouTube channel. I like to come to you with um, a project and introduce you to new skills as you go. Same thing with this blanket. I showed you how to weave in yarn ends with garter and how to change color and attach a new yarn without any struggles. So the books are the same way. They um, teach you a new technique and then there's a project or two to go with each one. And there's sweaters, um, there's bags, I made a dog sweater. There's all kinds of projects. Each one has about 30 projects in it. So they were large undertakings when I wrote those books. Okay, so the next question is, um, from Linda, what brand of interchangeable knitting needles are best? I actually, if you go to tools in the description below, somebody asked that question. I think it was Soapy. And I have um, a whole YouTube video on my favorite interchangeable knitting needles and which are the best. I've pretty much tried almost every needle on the market. Um, my favorites are listed like I said, in the video, and then I provide lots of links in the description of that video for the best knitting needle interchangeables. And that was from Linda. Thank you so much for that question. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so TLC Lopsided Crafter prefer heel, Preferred Heel on Socks. Um, I know I've tried the... Um, after, I can't think of the name of it, Afterthought, <laughs> the Afterthought heel, but I have to say, I think my regular, my favorite heel is just a standard turned heel where you create the heel flap. I guess I'm just a traditionalist when it comes to this, where you turn the heel flap, you make the cup shaping for the, the heel shaping, and then you do, do the sides. Uh, there's something really rhythmic to me about that and I love thinking of a sock as almost like four projects in one because you've got the um you've got the um I, I'm drawing a blank here you've got the top of the sock you've got the heel shaping you've got the instep and the toe so it's like four projects in one so that is my favorite heel uh, let me see if I have any other questions I might um, have missed Okay, I think that's about it. And it's 128. Uh, 109 of you are still here. I'm so glad that you joined me today. Thank you so much. Uh, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Have a great day, everyone.